we exalt you. We worship you. Have your way in our midst, O oh God. Let your name be glorified. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. Good afternoon and welcome to church. This is the Well Oasis International, a place where sons come to manifest. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us, especially if it's your first time. We are delighted to have you in our midst. Amen. Um, how many of us were at Ruach 2023? <laughs> the King of Glory showed forth, and he showed forth mightily. Father Lord, we just return the praise to you today. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' name. We have a long way to go this afternoon, so I'm going to go really fast. As you know, we've been in the series, A Long Obedience. And this is installment number 11. We're going all the way to, I think, 13 or 14. I think we're going to 13. Um, Actually, we're going to 14. This is installment 11. We're going to 14. Last week, we looked at the subject matter of suffering, perseverance. And um, our big focus was the fact that um, God already put a process in his word that if we find out, it will help us deal with mental suffering and anguish. Hallelujah. So last week, we looked at Cases of depression. We looked at cases of just not understanding why you feel the way you feel. And we saw in Psalm 130 the power of hope. God did not say to us, um, do not acknowledge that your mind is suffering in any given time. Instead, what God told us was to run to him. When we feel like we're suffering in our minds. When we have no words to articulate how we feel. When, when people would ask us what's wrong with us, we can't tell exactly what it is that is wrong with us. God said, when you have no words, run to him. Hallelujah. And what, part of what we said, at least in this place at the well, is that if you feel yourself with mind issues, don't hide We said that in God, there are no stigmas when it comes to our mind. God understands that the enemy plagues our mind. I talked to us a bit about the power of memory and the power of imagination. But I also talked to us about the comfort of memory, that men tend to live from memory. And because of that, it's only the things that you've gone through before. 80% of them, the things that didn't work out for you, that your memory tends to filter when you find yourself in the place of future um, decisions and growth. Hallelujah. But if you know what this whole series is about, this series is about the sum of our sense. Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And we're looking at the posture of disciples and the journey with God. We've looked at subject matter like um, um, joy. We've looked at the many things we've looked at, if you remember. Time will fail me to begin to delve into them. But just for you to know that the sum of our sense is we are distilling what the posture of a believer or a disciple should be as they journey with God in the good times and in the bad times, in the seasons of stagnation and in the seasons of acceleration. It's the seasons where you feel alone and the seasons of joy when you have people around you. There is a way God wants the child of God to look in those seasons. Part of what we've seen so far is that somehow being a believer does not exempt us from the occurrences of life. Whether you are a believer or not, someone will still die in your family. Somebody will fall sick. You would even fall sick sometimes. Sometimes as a believer, you would run through the place where you don't have money. In some other place, you will have a lot of money. As a believer, sometimes no one will understand you, so you will be lean on friends. 
And sometimes everyone will flock around you because there is a success around you and they want to identify with it. Whether you find yourself in the place of abundance or in the place of a lack, the Bible says there is a posture that the disciple must master. And what we've been looking at in this last 11 weeks is to distill that posture so that you know it and I know it. So that when we find ourselves in those situations, we are not confused about how we ought to present. Hallelujah. Today we are going on to Psalm 131. And Psalm 131 is three verses only, but three verses that are packed high. God, when I looked at Psalm 131, I was like, this Bible, have I been reading it, Nay? Or did they just add this part to the Bible? Apparently, they've always been there. But you only see what you are looking for. Yes? So, I can't sit here and say to you, I've never read Psalm 131 before. But I'll say to you that in this season, I have read it differently. I've understood it differently. Praise God. And that's why God's word is new every morning according to the Bible. Because I could have read it last year and it would have made a different meaning to me than it is making to me now. Right? Hallelujah. So last week I made a statement and I want to reiterate it before I move forward. I said that the disciples journey requires a constant continuous maintenance the journey of a disciple or of a believer requires a constant and continuous constant means you're doing it and then it's continuous you don't know when it will end yes it requires a constant and continuous maintenance it must be attended to it must be given priority it must be invested in and watched over intently if you therefore are a believer whether you're a 10-year-old believer or you're a 100-year-old believer, and I mean in the life of your, in the length of years of your new life, if you are not paying attention and being intentional about your journey, the odds are you will find yourself rusty. The odds are, you, uh, the chances are high that you'll find yourself at some point in a funk. You will be in disconnected from what God wants you to be and where he wants you to go. So even if you're not going to hear anything else, I'm going to say this afternoon, remember that if you are a believer, if you're one who believes in Christ, your life requires what? Maintenance. If you painted your house five years ago, you know by now, even if you use the best paint, by now you are either needing a cleaning or a touch-up. If you bought a brand new car two years ago, I agreed you only service once or, uh, in six months. If you haven't serviced in those two years because you thought to yourself, it's a brand new car I bought, I mean, and I don't go out much, da, 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 da. The car will begin to show you signs that it is needing attention. Hallelujah. If you are a believer and you've been in pain for a while and you have been masking it and you have done nothing about it, a day is going to come and you are going to have that bust. And then all the pain and all the things you are trying to do and show that you are a superhuman Christian <coughs> will disintegrate before you. The point I'm making is everything that God created and handed to us from our very lives requires what? Maintenance. Hallelujah. So I told you that the disciple's life requires a constant, continuous maintenance. It must be attended to, it must be given priority, and it must be invent, invested in and watched over intently. So you can't say that you are a believer and yesterday, you know, what happened, something happened yesterday and you responded or reacted in a certain way. And if you are working on your life, you expect that the same way you responded and reacted yesterday is the same exact way you do today. Because the point of maintenance is growth. So when you begin to maintain your life properly, growth will come to you as a matter of course. Hallelujah. In Psalm 131, the focus, when you look at it initially, it looks like humility. But the focus really is contentment. The Bible wants us to see, or the psalmist, or the spirit of God today, wants us to see the place of contentment in the journey of a disciple. By the time you understand contentment today, you will see that there is no hope without contentment. Hallelujah. As disciples, like we have seen time and time again, our lives are not beds of roses. Tell me one person who hasn't had to cry in their lifetime that is seated here. Then I'll tell you, you are 
we should do deliverance for you because you're a liar. Um, it's either that you are a liar or your tear dots don't work. Either way, you need a touch of God. Hallelujah. Our lives are not beds of roses. We go through seasons in which we, like other men and women, need to pass through. We go through seasons in which we need to wait. We go through seasons in which we are uncertain. We go through seasons in which we deal with loss. We go through seasons with, where we go through mental suffering, amongst many others. Yet, as we go through all these different seasons, God expects us to steward them with his posture of humility and contentment. A posture of humility and contentment. These two will come together to form a devotion to his will and to his way. Hallelujah. So when you look at Psalm 131, it's, it, it will open our eyes to a number of things. Number one, that humility leads to contentment. Number two, that contentment is the raw material for hope. Number three, that hope is how we hold on till he shows us his salvation in the land of the living. Hallelujah. I said Psalm 131 will show you three things. Number one, it will show you that humility leads to contentment. Number two, it will show you that contentment is the raw material for hope. And number three, it will show you that hope is how we hold on till he shows us his salvation in the land of the living. The thing is that the qualities of humility, contentment, and hope are how we sustain the seasons of our lives in God. Therefore, Psalm 131 is a maintenance psalm. Hallelujah. Psalm 131 is a maintenance psalm. This psalm for me highlights two things. That a disciple must prune, must prune himself in the maintenance culture to ensure his life leads where it should be. Two things we, you will see. There are two things that a disciple must prune in himself if he will arrive where he needs to go. The first thing, don't worry, I'll read the scripture and then I will delve into it. But if I don't lay this foundation, you will not understand where I'm going. Number one, unbridled ambition. Unbridled ambition. Many years ago, well, not too many, I think it was in 2017, Effectual Magazine featured me on the cover. And when they had done the interview and everything, they asked me what the title should be. And I said they should... Title it be me Mark Modi, unashamedly unambitious. I remember someone said, How would you describe yourself as unambitious? And I said, There was a day I was ambitious, but today I aspire for the things that God has called me to do. Is ambition bad? No, we will get to it. But the point of Psalm 131 is unbridled ambition. That is ambition that has no parameters will put you in trouble. Ambition without a goal and a leverage will put you in trouble. And we better be sure that that goal is within the parameters of what God has called you to. The ambition that drives people, that chase for some kind of glory, that defies the need of process is what we call unbridled ambition. It's driving you. You are running because of this ambition. You know, your friend just bought a house in face, whatever. You want to buy a house in face, the other one. And the idea is not, you're not trying to buy the house because you need a house. You're not trying to buy the house because God has told you that's your next step. You just want to buy that house so that you too can show it on Instagram that you got a new house. In phase one. So lucky things. <laughs> oh God of heaven. This unbridled ambition is why you find in the body of Christ the name it and claim it theology. Theology that has no basis in the word of God. They just say you should name it, you claim it. All the things you've been naming and claiming for 42 years, have they come to pass? No. And the reason they won't come to pass is that they're not founded anywhere. And that doctrine is not rooted in the word of God. Another one doctrine that has come out of unbridled ambition is grace covers me. So you sleep with someone else's wife, grace covers you. Nonsense that we kill you is what you are saying. Grace covers you. How? The third one is righteousness is old school. So really, when you think about righteousness, you think about people over 60. The rest of us, righteousness is old school. 
You know, this kind of Christianity we are running now is a Christianity where, you know, it's um, um, power suits and, you know, um, whatever. But the point is, it's ambition that is driving. It's not God. When ambition is what is driving you, the, 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 the trick is that you will cross lines and not even realize you have crossed lines. Everything will look nice to you because it yields a result that the world applauds. Unbridled ambition. Those who are plagued with this outlook of life think they are special because they belong to Jesus. And indeed, they are special. Anyone who belongs to Jesus is special. But where it gets tacky is that they misconstrue this to mean that they are above the law. Once you are a believer, I don't care what you, if you think that you can stay in your house and pray away the traffic light that you beat, pray away the fine. You are not a believer, you are the devil's junior brother. Because the reason why the the traffic lights are there and the reason why there is a speed limit is so that you don't get yourself overrun, running over things and killing people. So if you overrun, shoot the the, the, the speed limit and you are stopped or you, yes, you are issued a ticket, what you should do is go and pay it. They didn't issue you a ticket because they hate you. They issued you a ticket so that it will serve as a deterrent. So the next time you are going through that road, you understand that there are other road users and I need to be what the Bible says, considerate of them. But if you receive the ticket and you go and you put it on your table and you put anointing oil and you begin to pray that the policeman that issued it will go blind, you, are, you loaned yourself to the devil that day. But that's what unbridled ambition does. Unbridled ambition says it's his finder's fee. So you pay 20 million over a contract of 15 million. Or they tell you the contract is worth 20 million. They ask you to quote 45. But in that your own 20 million, you're going to make 10 million. So in your mind, God favored you. God favored you to fleece the government out of 30 million. You're a thief. Unbridled, but unbridled ambition says do it. Because in your church, there is a race to testify that I have hammered. And so testimonies that are supposed to be things that glorify God, they become the things that press people. Have you seen my latest car? I just did this one. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, I come to this same church and they confess before this person every day. If they say pray, I mean, I pray, they shout past. Why is this girl making all this money? And then she will tell you that she was just seated at home and they called her out of the blue. Somebody I just didn't know. And they just called me. And before I knew it, they said I should bring my documents. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, you are lying. Did you? Did they call you from the house or they called you for a hotel? But ambition, all of us sitting there will not even see this thing that I'm saying. We are clapping, we are delirious with joy that we have one more millionaire in our midst that we did not ask girl come. Which school you go where they will just, you'll, you'll just sit down for us. The government will call you say, me, you can't take contract. Where you, where, where do you they rob? Even if the person cuts so for you, no go go out first. Ooh. Are you hating me already? You can't fit. You love me. These people, as far as they are concerned, their status as believers makes them untouchable and consequently do not need to be maintained. That's where you hear things like once saved, forever saved. Hell is clapping for you. The devil has made one special, prepare one special place for you. So you are going and you are saying once one saved, forever saved. Mm, they will soon cut you. They chalk everything to grace. Grace is the explainer for everything that happens to them. Without the acknowledgement that grace compels us to submit We insist when we have unbridled ambition, we insist that we are above consequences. So we we mistake the rule of God to mean our own rule. So we say we are beyond consequences. You know, if nothing happened to me, you know, God loves me. The Bible says, he whom the father loves, he chastises. So where did you get your own that because he loves you, then he will beat you again. The second thing that every um, disciple needs to prune 
according to Psalm 131, is what the, uh, you know, the, um, what, what um, Eugene Peterson re- refers to as infantile dependency. This thing where we don't want to grow up. You know, we just want to continue to drink milk. The Bible says milk is for the babes, but you are like, I'm exactly the babe. I want to continue to drink milk. This level, this other group of the so-called disciples, they run away from anything that will put responsibility on them. They don't want it. They insist that God is obligated to take care of them. That even when to sweep their room, they will ask God to do it. To wash the clothes they wear on Monday to work, they will ask God to do it. They wake up on Monday, it begins to rain, they get angry. God has been telling them by his only Holy Spirit throughout last week as they were going and coming. Every time they were passing a particular store, Holy Spirit will say, enter and buy umbrella. You never get car, go buy umbrella. Go buy umbrella. Monday, you know, buy. Tuesday, you know, buy. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Monday, he has an interview. Rain begin fall. It begin cause either he go cause in, in stepmother for village. Shall he will look for a scapegoat, forgetting that the Holy Spirit has been telling him daily, go get yourself an umbrella. Hallelujah. Are we together so far? This group of believers, we share responsibility, and we avoid anything that will make us admit that we are in the wrong. We blame the consequences of our actions on the devil. We insist that the devil must die and be roasted by fire. Unfortunately, that's above your pay grade. You cannot kill the devil. So you can continue to continue to try. This set of believers refuse to steward their salvation. They do not understand what Paul meant in Galatians 4.2 when he said that every child, even though he's an heir, requires both the ministry of the tutor and the governor for them to arrive where they go. Even when God will forcefully bring them and pluck them in front of a tutor, they will journey. They will find a reason why in, sitting in front of the tutor is not convenient. I'm not even talking of the governor. They will not even smell the governor because the governor will put limits on them. Remember, they just want to fly. If I had a name for these believers, I'll call them the soft life believers. Soft life. You just want flex. Just want to flex. Sorry, carrot and seed. Carnal Christian. Okay, I don't know even that, that, that's too spiritual because they will still complain say you, you they speak too much Christianese for them. So let's all call them the soft life ones. Everything about them is their shirts and their ties and their skirt suits and their whatever. But Psalm 131 opens with God. I am not trying. If you read it in the New Message Translation, Psalm 131 says, God. I am not trying to rule the roost. I don't want to be the king of the mountain. This is your Bible. In the New King James translation said, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. It is not that we cannot understand what these words mean, It is that we struggle to comprehend them in the light of the doctrine that we had swallowed as the word of God. We are struggling to surrender our will to God. So we say that must be a problem. How can a believer say, I don't want to be the king of the mountain? 80% of the messages we teach in church today say you should be the king of the mountain. Isn't that so? Say every uh, the Bible says you are the head, not the tail. So when you get there, everybody must perish so that you you can come up. And I keep wondering if God has to kill someone for you to come up every day, will anybody else be alive for you to do life with? So it's not that you don't understand when it says, My heart, I'm not trying to rule the roost. It's not that you don't understand when it says, My heart is not haughty. 
but within the dynamics of what we know as that the believer is the believer's lifestyle is winner takes all you have to win every time you never get the short end of the stick because of that mindset when you read scriptures like this you're like um nah let's Let's skip to the one that says the oil will fall from the head of Aaron to his bed because that one looks like he holds a promise. The psalm continues in the message translation. He says, I have not meddled where I have no business or fantasized grandiose plans. You'll be like, what's wrong with a child of God dreaming? No, he didn't say he didn't dream. He just said, I did not dream the one you didn't give me to dream. I'm not going to let a sin this life be the benchmark for my life. I will pursue what God has called me to pursue. That is, I, I will aspire to the things that God's spirit is sending me to. But I will not be, I will not meddle. It doesn't matter to me that Kelly's jacket is this shiny. It really does not matter to me. Because I did not just get married two weeks ago. So Kelly just got married. He has to be dressing it up for his bride right now. Do you get it? So if someone enters and looks at you, I say, ah, next Sunday, that kind of jacket I won't wear. Voicemail, you miss road because you don't know what he may call a dress like that. Do you understand this conversation? He said, I haven't meddled where I have no business or fantasized grandiose plans. The psalmist understands that as powerful as a disciple is by the power that Jesus has given, that power must be submitted to the sovereignty of God and only deployed at his command and his say-so. What I'm saying, let me say it in pidgin English. If you try go where God never send you, you go break leg. That's not to say that God will not send you there tomorrow. But if today he never send you, put your leg for that road, you go break. Because the grace to support you on a journey that God has not sent you is not available. So we are clear on the power of principles of God. But we are also very careful that we do not deploy them without consideration for others and for his will. For example... Let my landlord die. So that I can inherit his house. Seriously? If you inherit a dead landlord's house, you too will die. Another person will inherit it that is not your child. But don't we pray this? We pray it. Maybe not in those exact words. We pray to say the, 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 the family that gave us the place to use for church in the name of Jesus. Make them not know anything that they do again. I don't care what you... Uh, let them forget that we are there. You were telling them to lose their mind. Person walk, he sweat, he building house. You should make him lose their mind. When your Bible does not make you a child of God. Don't go and walk. Be looking for... That's why landlords give. Their children are taking you to court now. Because their children say, I don't know what my mama they do when he give them the house. No, I don't know what they give my pa drink when he give them house. We want our father's house back. So you find ministries in church, in court, over someone else's property that have no need to be in court. Because if the owner way gets in house saying no do again, you're supposed to just leave. Or beg. Hallelujah. But what is this Christian, what is the scripture we hold on to for this nonsense? Say, the Bible says we shall live in houses we did not build. If you read your Bible, the houses you did not build is when you are in captivity. (laughs) So before you live in a house you did not build, they don't carry you go slavery. Be careful what you wish. Read your Bible. Without recognizing and acknowledging that the promise to give people houses they did not build is not a permission for manipulation. But a promise we should allow God work out if it is his plan for us. We attempt to play God without regard for his will in the matter rather than seek his will before we act. What is wrong with ambition, Sister B? Nothing. As long as it does not derail you and me. 
Many years ago, God told me, he said, I said, sir, he said, ambition that is not rooted in my purpose and will is deadly. I said, sir, I have heard. He said, dream all you want, but if you have a dream that does not take off from my purpose and lands on my will, you are treading very slippery ground. I said, sir, I've heard you. So my prayer every day is, Father, may I never forget that ambition that is not rooted in purpose and, his, and your will is deadly. So yes, I want God to use me to do great and lofty things. That's my dream. That's my prayer every day. That's what I strategize if I have the opportunity to. But if he chooses to use me in what the world would term as small and lowly things, I ask for the grace to do small and lowly things with a great and lofty posture and attitude. Because you can take a small thing and the way you do it is what will make a small thing become great. Hallelujah. The world, what am I training you to be? I'm training you to manifest as sons. That's what I'm doing. I'm not training you to go and stand by the roadside and be falling on your faces. I'm training you to ride the roost when you show up. That you show up and you are not riding this roost because you are inconsiderate. You are riding and ruling the roost because when you show up, you show up with the fullness of Jesus on the inside of you. Hallelujah. What this means is that God wanted me to learn to relinquish the reins of control so that I would remain in relationship because every time there is no humility, guess what gets lost in the process? Relationship. Every time humility does not exist, relationship is what gets destroyed. Even within people. If I'm not humble before my friend and my friend does not treat me with humility, it may take time if one of us is long-suffering. But ultimately, wherever humility does not exist, relationship will get destroyed. So wherever humility does not exist between God and man, it's just a question of time before that relationship is eroded. Hallelujah. Let's, if you look at Isaiah, I don't even want to read it yet. Isaiah 14, verse 13 and 14. How many of us know that scripture? Is the account where Satan said, I will, I will, I will. What was his problem? What was his problem? No humility. Yes, pride is no humility, isn't it? The moment he lacked humility, he went from Lucifer, the anointed cherub. Is that not what he was called? And he became Satan, the devil. What happened? What led to that transition? A lack of humility. The moment there was no humility, relationship was destroyed. The moment relationship was destroyed, God had to cast him down. Hallelujah. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 9. <laughs> Am I making sense so I'm just talking? First Timothy chapter 6, verse number 6 to 9. In the New King James translation. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with this, shall we, be con we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful loss. We drown men in destruction and perdition. Where did we start for? From godliness with contentment is growing great gain. It was maybe about eight years ago, God told me, said, Bidemi, do you want to be wealthy? I said, yes, sir. Who doesn't want to be wealthy? So even including me and I and myself, I don't mind being wealthy. And he said, if you ever want to touch wealth, you must learn contentment. I said, uh -huh. He said, unless you are content, you can never touch wealth. And I'm still working it out. I haven't arrived. But what I have found is everywhere I'm content, I feel like I'm wealthy. Do you see it? it because that's just, it is very, it's, the logic is so simple. Initially, when I heard it, I thought he was saying, if I just begin telling, to tell people that I'm content, they'll begin to give me money. 
But the more I told myself, be me be content. It's two cabin biscuits you have. Eat it today and drink water. And thank God for cabin biscuit because there was a day you didn't have cabin biscuit. Then it, another day is digestive. I don't eat biscuits much, by the way. Digestive. So I eat it and I say, Father, thank you for that. After a while, it will begin to feel like I eat digestives or shortbread or those things every day. You just feel wealthy, not because you have money. That's people will be envy you and gano no guy you. But they envy you because the goodness of God is reaching all over you. Because you are not strung out and stressed with lack of content. Hallelujah. What I learned when I put this godliness with contentment is great gain side by side. With a culture that we like ours that continually insists that the bigger, the shinier, the bolder, the louder, the more popular is the proof that God is in the mix. Is that it is increasingly difficult to be content and anointed at the same time. Our culture everywhere in the world says if it's bold, if it is loud, if it is big, if it is plenty, if it is famous, if it is shiny, those things are proof that God is in the house. So you, when you are anointed but you are not loud, you are not big, you are not shiny, you are not any of those things, you find yourself struggling. So we find that anointing and contentment is, is becoming difficult to be anointed and content at the same time. Because the press to be what God did not ask us to be is more than the, pre- the pull to be where God is positioned us. Hallelujah. A wise man once said that humility, pay attention to this. He said humility is the observe side of confidence. O-B-S-E-R-V-E, observe side. I put it in another way. I adapted it and I said humility is the wait and see side of our confidence in God. Humility is the wait and see side of our confidence in God. You cannot be confident in God and not have to observe for a while. You cannot say you have confidence in God and God will not prove that confidence by withholding or just holding off for a while. So humility is the wait and see side of our confidence in God. If you say you are confident that your God is your God, you will have to wait and see. Hallelujah. So when we approach our journey as disciples with humility and contentment, we are clear that God has reposed great authority and power in us. But we are also willing only to deploy it when he says deploy. It does not make sense that the, 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 the soldiers have been lined up and they, of course they have a leader, don't they? They have a commander or whatever, a platoon leader or something. There's someone who will give the command to fire before they release their arms, isn't it? So if they just get there and there is no command and we begin to shoot sporadically, what's likely to happen? We are, people are going to get dead and they are most likely going to be our people. Do you get it? They will say they died from friendly fire. Why? Because every journey is a battle. And only the God of heaven tells you when to release a bullet. That's why if we saw in El Shaddai yesterday, he said, walk before me and be blameless. That is, if you are walking before me, you will listen to my instructions. If you listen to my instructions, you would hear me. If you hear my instructions, the grace for you to obey them is available. So what is the difference between aspiration and ambition? Aspiration, the great, let me begin by saying the great line of this conversation that we're having today is caught in the reality that while God wants us to be careful with ambition, he does not desire for us to be without aspirations. That's the great line. So we have to constantly ask ourselves, is this the one that God wants me to aspire for? Or is this the one I should hold back on? That's why it is relationship based. It's nothing else but relationship based. Hallelujah. So I think sometimes we unconsciously, let's give ourselves that pass mark, that sometimes when we step into unbridled ambition, it is because we unconsciously slipped. 
We were walking in inspiration, and because the lines became blurry, we just slipped into ambition that God did not send us. What that means, therefore, like, is that as believers and as disciples, we each must have what I call a safety valve. There must be something that saves you when you find yourself running off without God saying so. And mine is easy. Many years ago, I found a scripture that says that God's everlasting arms and believe and beneath me. So I told God, anytime you see me falling, please don't let me hit the ground. Catch me. But the other thing I said to him was, Lord, anytime I am falling because I'm making the wrong decisions. And it looks like I'm swearing because those kinds of falls, they actually feel like you are taking off. I told God, I said, it doesn't matter what I have invested in a venture that is not yours. Frustrated. Because there are times I know I'm limited in myself. So there are times that I may not know to rein myself in. Father, rein me in by frustrating what you did not send me. So every time I put my all into something and it is frustrated and I know it's not the devil. I remember that prayer and that covenant and I say, Lord, I'm sorry. So I pull myself back. Sometimes I've found that it's not because God didn't want me to do that thing at all. It was 80% of the times because I ran ahead of him. So he'll frustrate it in this season. And three seasons down the line, he will bring it back. And then it will be smooth. It will be effortless. I'll get where I need to go really fast. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? So I have just said to you that you need a safety valve too. Distill one that works for you. Don't use mine. Sit with God and say, Lord, what will work for me? Hallelujah. Verse 2 of, of Psalm 131 says, remember it's only three verses, because somebody's heart caught when I said verse 2. Like, hey, now verse 2 with this is money. Now only three verses now, chill. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 2 of Psalm 131. says, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a winged child with his mother. Like a winged child is my soul within me. If you read it in the message translation. The message says, I have kept my feet on the ground. I have cultivated a quiet heart. Like a baby content in its mother's arms. My soul is a baby content. Now, if you read it in the, King, in the New King James translation, you'll see the word that was used. That what made this baby? There's a difference. There are two kinds of baby that, babies there. There's a baby that is quiet and winged. And he's, he says, I have, let me read it again in the King, New King James. It says, like a winged child is my soul within me. Like a winged child with his mother. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a winged child with his mother. You need to see, know a winged child. Mothers, when you're winning your child, why is it like, are they quiet? When you start the winning process, are your children quiet? They are not. Because they used to breast milk all of this way. And all of a sudden, you, be, you cut them off. And you begin to introduce something else. The children usually, most of the time, cry through the night. Because it looks like the only source of sustenance they know, you have plucked it away. And they, they actually, I think, in their mind, they think they are going to die. That you are about to starve them to death. So, survivor kicks in. And a child that is going through the winning process begins to cry. But when that child now realizes that winning does not mean you will not feed them again. It just means that they have grown to a level and you are going to give them food that is better for the, suited for their age. How do those babies do? They quieten down. So the psalmist said, I have calmed my soul down. He says, I am like a child who has been weaned by its mother and I am now quiet. I trust my mother now because I've gone through the winning process. And I can tell that she didn't, her winning me is not to starve me to death. Her winning me is to introduce to my diet something that is better for me at the age that I am. Do you see this picture? I don't think you saw it. Can you see this picture? 
So this visual imagery is something that you need to see. That the child that Psalm 131 is talking about, when you are a content Christian, when you are a content believer, you are like a child who not trusts his, it's his mother because he has gone through the winning process and knows that even though it's no longer breast milk, there is still food for me. So, when the mother carries this child now, this child is now forcefully looking for the breast. Do you understand it? Contentment. Not the one that is crying. Ah! Ah! Wow! Ah! I have three children. My first, I didn't have the privilege to win him. Now he win me. <laughs> I went out, came back, gave him breast, said he didn't want, gave him formula. Kenichi has always been, from a baby, he's always been a considerate human being. From a child. At six months, he decided, I don't want breast milk anymore. And there was nothing I was going to do about it. So we just seamlessly, he did, we didn't go through that one one stage I was trying to describe. Chidi Abele, it took Amala. And it would do. Once she, swal- she tasted swallow, Winning was good for her because Chidi Abele was the child that if you gave her formula when I was out of the house, if I'm out for three hours, she will hold that formula because that girl is smart. Up to today, she's the most street smart of my children. She knows that if she vomits the formula when I know they have hunger, go do her. She will hold that thing in. I'm not joking. The moment I come, ask her father is there. <laughs> How was it? And cry, then she she will take it. Yes, mm-hmm. cry again. The point is, she until she found the bar, she she realized that this replacement is even better than that one I was crying over. She did not bother. Joshua is a different matter. Joshua, <laughs> he circled the, the the longest. And then when we were winning him, he won't fight with you. He wait for you to sleep. Then he will come. He will kick your dog. Wow. And he will climb the bed and pluck on you and be looking for his breast. That's Joshua. Three different children. Three ways to go through the winning process. God wants us to be like KK. He wants us to know when we have outgrown a thing. And rather than being crying and crying and crying and hustling for it, recognize that the mother or the father knows what is good for your next stage. So therefore, what the father or the mother will give you for the next stage is the best thing for you in that stage of your life. Do you get it now? Hallelujah. So he said, my soul is quieted. I've calmed and quieted my soul. Like a wind child with his mother, like a wind child who is my soul, is my soul within me. Verse 3 says, the point is that to survive in a life and journey that requires maintenance, we must have hope and expectation that things will be better. So even when the child was going through the winning process and crying, if the child understood hope, that no, this is my mother. There's something I can tell about my mother. Many things I can't tell. But I know that my mother loves me. And because my mother loves me, she would not starve me to death. Hope. So even if she doesn't give me breast milk, I know she's about to give me something else. Hope. Psalm 131 says, instead of all this fat guru, let God show you the way to go. Instead of all this trial and error and stepping on toes, let God lead you in the way that you will go. That is the posture of a believer. We must have hope and expectation that things will be better. Yet we will be content where we are at the moment. Do you see it? What's my dream car? I usually don't have, I've had a dream car once, but now I have another one. Yes, I didn't even know the name, but I knew I had a car that I wanted. And I said to my husband, I want another car. I said, I said, no, I don't want that brand. I said, okay. I said, I don't mind the Toyota. Then he went out and he came back. I knew the car. I had seen the name before, but I had forgotten it. And he just was trying to remember the name. By the time he said four, I said, yes, that's the car. 
But the point is, while I'm waiting for that car, because it's my dream car, I'm not going to whine over the foreigner that I have right now. It is still good enough. Do you get it? Because it doesn't break down. The AC works. It's, it has enough clearance to climb through things. But it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Yes, I'm feeling antsy that, okay, maybe, 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 maybe. But I am not going to go and steal simply because I now have a dream car. I'm not going to go and compromise simply because I now have a, a dream car. Do you understand this thing? This thing, you can apply it to something as simple as I want water and I want cold water. To something as, as big as I want to live in VGC and I'm living in Agege. You can apply it anywhere. Because just because you are in Agege this season does not mean that VGC does not have your name on it. Do you see it? It just means that you have not mastered where you are. It's time. So why you, before you get where you are headed, surely because God wants to give you good things. Before you get there, will you not act like a small, spoiled brat and just be content? All this nonsense of yanny, yanny, yanny. Everything with time will see you. Something is wrong with your Christianity. Every time, ah, God, if God will just remember me. You, you were saying God should remember you for pencil. Now he's giving you biro. You are saying God should remember you for fountain pen. He will give you fountain pen. You will come back and say you want Parker. He will give you, you will come back and say you want Mont Block. He will give you Mont Every day we see you. No no time that you say thank you Jesus all you are saying is eh, I want I want I want are you a grave Eugene Peterson says that aspiration is the channeled creative energy that moves us to growth in Christ aspiration is the channeled creative energy that moves us to growth in life Ambition, especially when it's unbridled, is when we pursue things for the sake of pursuing them. Or for a goal that doesn't ultimately bring us to glory be to God. Hallelujah. The point is that our lives are best lived on the terms of their creation. The way God created you is the way you should live. I can try really hard, but I don't need a soothsayer to tell me I would not make a good doctor. I will not. I don't need a suicide to tell me. But this one I'm doing right. I'm good at it. I'm good at it. And so even though I hear that if you're a doctor and you go to Saudi, you make money. <laughs> even if you concern me, no change anything. This is where I'm at. I'm content here. Because even though I don't know where this is leading... I can't see it right now, maybe, but I have seen in other people's lives that even this one has brought people to the place where they, are, they have enough to deal with the things that they need to deal with. Do you see that? In his book, The God Players, that book, I checked it today when I was coming out. When I bought my own, I bought it $71, and I bought like a third hand use. The one I found on Amazon today is $114. This book is all of a hundred pages. It's an old book. It's called The God Players by a guy called El Jabe. J-A-B-A-Y. In his book, The God Players, he said that man's tendency is to repeatedly put themselves on the throne where God should be. So you don't want your child to suffer. Even though God has said that a little suffering is good, you put yourself on the throne, you play God. You don't want whatever it is that God is ordained for a person's path. And you stand as an obstructor because you have the power. You put yourself on the throne in the place of God. I know my child will not go to that school. But you knew that you heard God that that is where your child will be formed for the journey that is ahead of him. You obstruct to say, I know no child of me is going to go to this kind of school. You put yourself on the throne. You throw God out. And then when the child comes back with a drug habit, it now becomes, thank God I'm not one of those pastors that prays those prayers. Don't call me at night. Especially when you know that you are the one. That, that puts yourself on the throne. The point I'm making, my brothers and sisters, 
is that when we play God, we fail to acknowledge our limitedness. We are not all that. God is the only all-knowing. God is the only ever-present. God is the only all-powerful. You and me don't have that. So as great as we want to be, that limitedness is what God left so that we can always lean on him. And to enjoy your posture of a content disciple, you must recognize that God is sovereign and he wants you to consistently lean on him. So there is no room for you and me to play God. Whether you are playing God by being over ambitious or you are playing God by playing the victim every time. Oh God, you did not lift my finger. Oh God, you did not comb my hair. Oh God, you did not brush my teeth. Oh God, you did not wash my clothes. Oh God, son, no dry. You know, all those nonsense things that we carry into our Christian work. You know, you know some believers, every day you see them, they have a complaint. Am I lying? There's ne- son, no, they ever shine for their life. Everything, some, every single day, there's something God hasn't done. And then you know the other ones, they don't need God. They saw God one day and they've been running since. They've climbed 43 mountains. None of them God was at. But we are clapping for them because every mountain shows they have arrived. So as we are clapping for them, they take our applause to mean the applause of God. They keep climbing. They keep, the higher they climb, the further away from God they are. And God is saying, whether you are climbing 43 mountains or you have complaints every day, that's not where I have called you to be. You must be the child that we go through the process of winning to come to the place where you trust me because you are content that I know you well. And the plans that I have for you, they are plans of good, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope and to bring you to your expected end. If I had a picture in the Bible, I would show you my time is up. I will show you the prodigal sons. I call them sons because both the one that went and the one that remained explain this thing. The one that went is the overly ambitious one. He wanted to climb mountains because he felt like his father was constraining him. The one that stayed would not dare to go because he felt he had to be on his father's at the end of his father's um, rope every time. He would not even dare hold a party for himself and his friends because his life was I must please my father. He had no imagination. He had no initiative. He had nothing. Everything his father said was all he did. And that was great except that 80% of your journey God wants you to take initiative. So the one that said give me my inheritance I'm done was the one that had unbridled ambition. The one that was the oldest one that was waiting for his father to say to him, you can kill goats today and eat, was the one that refused to mature. The one that had unbridled ambition, his father said to him, come back home. I'm waiting for you. The one that said, you did not even give me goat to eat. His father said, if you had asked me, I would have, if you even wanted, you should just have taken. There's room in, your, in my house for both of you. But you see that middle place, Both of us must remain there. Because our scale must not tilt this way or tilt that way. It's in the middle. That's where he wants us to be. Hallelujah. What I'm saying is that God wants us to recognize and embrace the difference between unruly arrogance and faithful and inspired aspiration. God wants us to recognize the difference between infantile dependency and childlike trust. What he wants us to do is to trust him like a child. He doesn't want children who are just lingering. You are three years, you want to continue to suckle because suckling is familiar to you. God is saying, no, it's time. Let's try something else. We are not going to even be taking cereal anymore. It's time for you to try some hardcore eba. Because there's something that develops in your life with Eba. And neither does he want you to get to the point where you think, I don't need my father. I've been weaned, so I'm good. I can go wherever I want. Because the greatest of us is still needs God. And the smallest of us obviously needs God. In verse 3 he said, Oh Israel, hope in the Lord. And from this, from this time forth, and forever. If you listen to the father when he spoke to his two sons, he said to the one who had the boldness to climb, 
He said to him, welcome back home. That one, by the time he had climbed and seen how far, as we say in Edo State, he said, don't even call me your son anymore. If you put me in the in the dog house, I'll be fine. I just want to be in the vicinity of your love. God said, I'm never going to do that to you. Come in home. There's still room for you. I never gave your room away. The one that said, ah, Papa, how can you let him come? I have been here obedient all my life. His father said, you refuse to leave. Now I give you permission. Go leave. Today I realized that that son did not go back into the house because the Bible never told us he went into the house. But that for the first time, he actually got up and left and went to leave because at that point he realized if I left to go play with my friends my father would still love me if I left to spend hours, you know, time outside of my father's house he would still love me but to know that is what it is about will God still love you if he knows how you are he will still love you but will you allow him to carry you whether you are the strong one or the weak one, will you let him bring you and guide you to the center? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's this conversation. Let him lead you beside the still waters. Say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God wants us to know that while we can't run away from him and do what we like, he also is not interested in believers who refuse to dream and refuse to go somewhere. Find your middle. Tell your neighbor, find your middle. Find your middle and stay there. Because godliness with contentment is great gain. Can we rise on our feet? Can we begin to thank the God of heaven? Talk to him. You know if you're a climber, you know. But are you climbing by instruction? There's nothing wrong with being a climber. But are you climbing by instruction? If you know you're a whiner, you also know. The question is, why do you whine so much? Speak to God for yourself. And you have, if you're here, and you're here to give your life to Jesus. Jesus is the only stabilizing factor on this spectrum. So if you would like to give your life to Jesus, say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Father Lord, I do not know how to find the balance, but I'm yielded to your spirit. Let your spirit lead me. Wherever you lead me, that's where I will go. I must find this balance because I will neither be unbridled, unbridled with ambition, nor will I be a whiny clinging child I will live for you exactly by your terms in Jesus mighty name amen and amen Father Lord we thank you for the communion bread uh, table thank you Lord for the invitation to come and partake of your body Lord Jesus Lord we break the bread and we sanctify this cup in the name of God the Father name of God the Son and name of God the Holy Spirit Father this week oh God let this partaking of your table let you open our eyes to see where our scale is tilted and help us come back to the middle let your name be glorified oh god father lord we honor and we worship you in jesus mighty name we have prayed amen